this is the, the panel in which, during which we will hear the voices of folks that haven't been here at the college um, for all that long. They're recent graduates, fairly recent graduates. They're actually here now uh, working on uh, graduate degrees, and they're also um, assistant professors uh, some of whom have a long history in the college, um, but others uh, of whom are uh, more recent additions. What I'm going to do, I forgot my book here, what I'm going to do is quickly introduce people, uh, and then we're going to start uh, with a series of comments, and then, um, and then uh, more open dialogue and discussion. Um, we're going to start with Malo Hudson, Malo is an assistant professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning. His, his research focuses on community development, regional planning, urban sustainability, and popu population health. And he also focuses on urban policy and politics and institutions um, in, in shaping development. So uh, you have uh, longer uh, uh, descriptions of everybody. I'm just going to uh, uh, provide you brief bios. Um, and you can read the longer ones at your leisure. Um, following uh, Malo will be Allegra uh, Bujakemski. Um, she's a landscape architect, and she leads the biohabitat uh, in, uh, uh, enterprise in San Francisco. Um, she uh, works on ecological restoration, conservation planning, and regenerative urban design. Um, following uh, Allegra will be Suzanne Cowan. Suzanne is a PhD candidate in architecture, and she also teaches uh, here as a graduate student instructor in the college. Um, she works on the history of urbanism and architecture, uh, and um, she has a background actually in landscape architecture. And she's uh, teaching a variety of courses, including um, the Survey of History of Architecture and Urbanism, Intro to Environmental Design, and Housing and International Survey, uh, an international survey. Um, third in the lineup will be uh, John Kerry. John Kerry is um, the executive director of an innovative uh, social venture called Public Architecture, located in San Francisco. Um, it was uh, it was started uh, and it, it just not so long ago, and um, John has been influential in leading this organization. It's a national nonprofit. Uh, and it mobilizes architects and designers to undertake pro bono and public inter interest design projects in underserved communities. Um, after John, we're going to hear from, where did she go? Re Reedy, I can't see you, Reedy. Um, um, uh, Reedy. Uh, Reedy Roy is a first year doctoral student in city and regional planning here at Berkeley. She has an uh, undergraduate degree in architecture and a master's in urban design. Um, and actually also a master's in, uh, in geography from Oxford. Um, so she's worked particularly on issues of participatory design and issues of food access in inner cities. Um, then we're going to hear from Bill, um, Bill Eisenstein. Bill is a graduate from Berkeley in landscape, uh, he has a PhD in environmental planning from the Department of Landscape, Architecture, and Environmental Planning, and a master's in city planning from, also from Berkeley, and he's the executive director of the Center for Resource Efficient Communities at UC Berkeley, a new enterprise focusing on um, how to make cities resource efficient, especially their outdoor spaces, so that, they, that they're comfortable and attractive for doing the kinds of things that Manuel just talked about in terms of biking and walking. Lastly, we're going to hear from uh, Ron Rail. So we're having the, the two assistant professors be the bookends. Uh, Ron is an assistant professor of architecture um, here uh, in the college, and he is um, also a, a, a writer, just wrote a wonderful book on, on earth buildings. Um, he comes to U, uh, UC Berkeley from Clemson, and um, he also uh, spent time at the Southern California Institute of Architecture and the University of Arizona, um, and also the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, so uh, we have a diverse group of folks, um, all with recent experience or current experience in the college. I've asked them to think about what should happen in the next 50 years. It's a little bit daunting, um, but I think they're going to have very interesting and provocative things to say. And what we're going to do is start 
um, with very short initial presentations, and then I want to encourage every, uh, the panelists to talk amongst themselves, and then we'll uh, encourage people to come to the podium and ask questions. So, Malo, it's yours. Great. You can hear me okay? Great. All right. Well, there's, um, as, as Dean Walsh said, there's eight, uh, we have about five minutes, so I just want to make eight points, um, more as an academic, but how I see the world changing, how I see metropolitan areas changing, and the role that uh, college environmental design can play in the next 20 to 30 years, maybe longer. Uh, but it applies to pretty much anyone who's focusing on issues related to the urban development. Um, the first thing is, which has been talked about already this morning, is increasing urbanization of the world. Um, so if you look at our metropolitan areas, they're increasingly becoming more and more urban. And I think that we're going to start to see conflicts over resources. They're already happening now, but increasingly so as we go forward over housing, water, land, and so forth. And so with those conflicts, um, I think we need to think about the ways that we think about our democracy, about the political process. How do we bring in people who don't have the same um, affluence, the people who are poor? How do we get them all in the same room in order to make decisions? Is there, is there a role for technology there? So that's the first thing. The second thing, along with urbanization, is the increasingly um, diverse communities that we see. How do we be more inclusive? especially when we're thinking about the inequality and wealth that I, just, that, that I just mentioned, but also the diversity of ideas. After all, when we think about being here in the Bay Area, we think about innovation and being innovative. And so how do we do that? How do our institutions reflect that? Um, as Professor Castells uh, mentioned earlier in his talk, that our institutions are not flexible. They're not innovative. Uh, so how do we do that in a way, how do we change our institutions in a way that incorporates the diverse ideas of the citizens who live in the community um, across all socioeconomic positions, education, sexual orientation, and so forth. Um, with that, the increasing urbanization, I think there's the, the need to focus on the environment and environmental sustainability, not only urban but also rural. Uh, what do we do with all of our industrial land? And so if you think about the Bay Area from San Leandro, San Leandro all the way up to Richmond, how do we coordinate the redevelopment of the land? Who's being exposed to environmental pollutants? So thinking about that, you see that uh, cities have climate action plans. So if Berkeley has a climate action plan, but Oakland doesn't, what good is Berkeley's climate action plan? So how do we coordinate across the region? How do we think about our food systems? How do we think about health? How do we think about transport? How do we think about the urban environment, which I'm sure many of my colleagues next to me will, will, will talk about? The fourth thing is, with all of this growth and development, how do you manage it? How do you govern it? Right? So when you think about our Constitution, there's the federal government, there's state, and there's local. But we don't have much to address metropolitan issues. So I'm not ask, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that we need a, another layer of government, but I would think what we need is regional governance, not regional government. Uh, and currently in the United States, we have over 90,000 jurisdictions. And each jurisdiction is doing their own thing. So if you look uh, at the largest metro areas, you have cities carving out their piece, right? So they attract companies to get their tax base. They'll attract double income, no kids, no kids type of people, people with lots of income. But how, if we're thinking about going forward, certainly environmentally, politically, socially, uh, how do we think about regional governance? And I think that we need to think about what types of systems and institutions will exist to do that. I know in the Bay Area we have ABAG. Where's Miriam? Is she still here? But we have to think about how we can be innovative there. In terms of the complexity of issues that we see in our cities, I mean, they're gonna to continue to just get more complicated. And if you look at other professions, whether it be engineering, biology, or so forth, they collaborate, they work with, they're not in silos, they work across not only universities, they work across uh, different departments and so forth. So I think that we have to think about as a discipline, certainly in the College of Environmental Design, how do we collaborate? For instance, I know in planning we have collaborations with public health, so there's a joint degree program there. We do a lot with law, public policy, and so forth. But I think that we have to think about that even uh, more as we go forward. So what are the possibilities for whether it be joint studios? So I'm teaching a community development studio right now focusing on uh, the California Endowments Building Healthy Communities Initiative. And my students, we're working in Richmond and in Oakland, but it requires a diverse set of skills. So we need people who have urban design, we need people who have the GIS, the finance, and so forth. But that's just, I think, as we think about the growth of cities and the development of cities and certainly the challenges that are gonna be raised through urbanization, especially around conflicts over resources and so forth, I think it's important that we have come up, you know, work more collaborative, collaboratively than we have in the past. Um, 
One other thing that I think would be important is to think about disasters and disaster planning. So what do I mean by that? Well, if global climate change is, is real, um, then we need to think about what types of disasters might come along with that, natural and also our human-made disasters. So I think of uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. How do we go in and rebuild? How do you ensure that the people who were living there before are able to come back and have a say-so in the future of their city? Or do we just allow a lot of people who didn't live there before to come in and rebuild the city? Um, what about, uh, you know, we had the tsunami that struck uh, a few years back, same thing there. And then most recently, that's in all of our minds, is Haiti. So when you see a, such a massive disaster such as that, how as planners, architects, uh, you know, urban designers, so forth, how do, we, how do we go in in a situation like that and help rebuild in a way that doesn't just impose our values, but takes the values of the people who live there? Uh, let me just conclude on talking about institutions and organizations. They matter a tremendous amount. And I think that we, we have to think about regional planning agencies. I think we have to think about how we do local planning. Certainly, Professor Castell's touched on the issues of zoning and so forth. And there's a great book by Gerald Frug, who's a Harvard Law professor who wrote a book, City Making. And he discusses the challenges around state legislation that allows cities to largely control land use and redevelopment um, on their own and, and, and control their own how they raise taxes, but it doesn't allow them or encourage them, or it doesn't encourage them, I should say, to think about equity, to think about being inclusive. Because as I said before, with all of our metropolitan fragmentation that you see jurisdictionally and so forth, it doesn't necessarily, uh, our development process right now doesn't necessarily uh, have us thinking about the long term, mostly the short term. Um, and then I'll, let me just say that it's very important, and I can touch on this uh, as in the you know, later on in this discussion about the importance of the flexibility and innovation within our institutions and organizations. So I think I'll just end there. Good morning. Um, first, I want to say I'm, I'm flattered to be here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up on Manuel Castell's um, lecture earlier where he mentioned that we are in a crisis, in a building, urban, and social crisis. And while um, he did speak of environmental concerns, I would really add environmental to that crisis, um, that I think the urban and the social and the building crisis has created an environmental crisis. Um, I was asked to sort of, being an alum and not currently affiliated with the school to ask about what CED should do moving forward. What should we focus on? So I want to touch a little bit about my thoughts about my time here when I was a student here. And I want to say that to a certain degree, Berkeley is not necessarily known for teaching the technical competency, AutoCAD, um, some of the other sort of savvy technical computer uh, wizardry that many other schools focus on, I would say, to the exception to a certain degree of the building science department and maybe the GIS. Um, and this really frustrated me as a student um, because I knew I needed to learn CAD to get a job when I graduated. But Berkeley, again, is known for teaching students how to think, how to design, how to push the boundaries. And now as a professional, I am so thankful that that's what I was taught while I was here. Um, that I learned the technical skills depending on um, the, the, the work that I was doing, um, but that I had the ability to push, to question, uh, and to constantly think about what the challenges were. And I think the other thing with the, while technology and a lot of the computer programs that are out there are really amazing and can be a great tool, it's also really hard to teach them because they are advancing at such an alarming rate that what you can teach someone in three years is completely outdated. Um, but teaching them how to think and how to use it and how to challenge it uh, as well as their thoughts and disciplines I think is, is sort of most important. Berkeley is also an amazing place. It's an amazing wealth of disciplines. Within the CED, there's 
architecture, planning, landscape architecture, environmental planning. But then in Berkeley as a whole, I think many students and potentially professors don't take advantage of all the other amazing um, world-class departments here. Music, biology, environmental science, um, business. There are constantly amazing lectures going on all over the campus on all sorts of topics that I think are relevant um, to all of us, and there needs to be more input from sort of other, other disciplines. I was always going over to the biology lectures. That's my background. Um, and with all of that, I would say that many, many recent graduates and professionals, to a certain degree, I think, struggle with their role as designers. What are we doing? Why did we choose this discipline? We sort of knew our interest initially, but then you kind of get into being a CAD monkey or you know some other you know basic work working um, for maybe some really great firms. But to a certain degree, I would say many principals out there. Um, are traditional or old school and to a certain degree continuing on their laurels or their design style and not necessarily progressing uh, in the current day and age and the needs. And I would challenge the College of Environmental Design and designers as a whole to really push the concept that design is more than eye candy, it's more than star architecture, it's more than um, just creating better networks that it is, design is something that can heal the earth, that can empower people, that can strengthen communities, and that can, can make lasting change. Um, and I think it's really important that we address more um, sort of the value and the reason behind design, um, integrating ecology, social justice, technology, um, to really be ahead of the curve and stay ahead of the curve and make a difference. Thank you. So as a current student and hopefully soon to be graduate, I'd like to um, continue on with some values that I think that we should continue as we move forward in our next 50 years as a college. And there's four things that I really think that make the CED strong and different from other schools that we should really continue to maintain. And then there's two different proposals that I'll make for um, immediate things that we might do here. So first I wanna say that interdisciplinary, having this interdisciplinary environment has really been a strength of the college since the beginning. And in 59, when we formed this college, we were a leader in creating that kind of interdisciplinary cooperation. And although we've maintained that throughout the years, and I see so much is, uh, interdisciplinary communication going on today. When almost all students take courses in all the different departments here in CED. Um, when many people are getting joint degrees and minors, I think that it's going to constantly be a struggle to create that type of cooperation that to some extent disciplinary and professional boundaries that these academic silos do have a structure that needs to be constantly struggled against and overcome. So I think that as we move forward, that should be a value that we should maintain and uh, to struggle to to support and improve upon. In addition, I'd like to say that one of our strengths is combining research and design. So our school has always been very strong in moving forward with new research and new ideas and being able to incorporate those ideas into the design process. And again, I think that we still have a very strong tradition of that here, having um, great design programs as well as great PhD programs. And I think that we, again, need to keep pushing that collaboration between design and research. As an undergraduate in the landscape department, I really saw a, a strong collaboration between the professors there where you didn't have a, a clear idea who was the designer and who was the researcher. It seems that everybody was doing both and the design studios were able to incorporate both. And I would love to see that kind of cooperation continue to uh, be part 
of our process, and I think that we can continue to strengthen that, uh, especially in the larger departments like architecture, where it's very easy for um, research and design to become separated. The architecture PhD program is very strong at dealing with the urban and the global scale, but sometimes that research does not always address the building scale and sometimes can become somewhat divorced from uh, the practice of architecture, dealing more with urban planning issues. So I think that moving forward to integrate research and design uh, more fully through cooperative uh, studios would be a good idea. Also, I think that, as Allegra was mentioning, we're very strong in our social and environmental focus and teaching our students to have strong ideas and a critical engagement with the world. Uh, so we create here not just uh, professionals with technical skills, but engaged citizens. And I think that that's something that we need to continue um, to, to focus on. Technology and aesthetics can be very seductive, but I think that we always need to question what is the social and environmental impacts of what we're creating, and to encourage students to take the information they learn in their lecture courses and to critique their own designs by that. And uh, finally, our focus on real world issues and in volunteering and getting out into the community. So I think that we should constantly push ourselves to leave this comfortable environment of the CED in Worcester Hall and get out and engage with uh, our community around us and with larger issues. So finally, just to make a couple of quick proposals for what we can do in the next couple of years. Um, I was inspired by what Manuel Castells was talking about with the current crisis that we're in. And I think that we need to engage with it in a very critical and engaging way. Uh, I am thinking about a studio that we had a few years ago in which um, the digital city in India, when, which we have an interdisciplinary studio that dealt with an urban issue at all different scales from architecture, landscape, city planning, economics, brought in all the different skills of the college into one collective project. And I think that that kind of collective project really engages the entire college and helps to spread the knowledge so that the knowledge in one studio does not remain in that studio but spreads throughout the entire student body. And I think that in the next uh, academic year, I would encourage us to take on another big project like that where we have interdisciplinary studio, um, perhaps in the Central Valley or in an area nearby where there's been major um, changes due to foreclosures, and to really contemplate the realities of the suburban environment, what its evolution will be, how we can engage critically with it at a policy level, at a design level, uh, as it evolves in response to this current crisis. And then finally, I would also encourage the students to continue to be countercultural and to go beyond what is possible, but to imagine new ways that their generation is gonna to respond to the current crises. Telesis, uh, a group here in San Francisco in the 40s was instrumental to creating this college. It was a group of young students and young professionals who didn't have work during the Depression, but who pushed the boundaries of what architecture and planning and landscape architecture could be uh, during that time of underemployment to really create a new vision for the future. And I think that we can do that here as students uh, as, as we move forward, really create our own generational image. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks, Jennifer and Mary and everyone else for making this thing possible. Um, a lot's been covered already. Uh, I should, if it's not already clear from, uh, well, everything about me, I, I'm not in this world, and so it's uh, a pleasure to come back and also a little daunting in some ways, but I'm a, I'm a simple guy, and so I'm going to talk in very simple terms. I hope that's acceptable here. Um, you know, mainly I think that... Uh, this college, and frankly every other school of design um, across the country, has an opportunity to say that it stands for something. That it stands for something and that it's the best in the world at that one thing, and orient itself and its faculty and its course offerings and majors and everything else under that. And I'm, I'm just not clear that that is the case at the moment. Um, I don't think it's unique to this college at all, uh, but I think that 
at a, at a point where we're looking back on 50 years, the chance to look forward 5, 10, 20, and, and 50 years is, is greater than ever. Um, I see, uh, I, I love one line that Jennifer uh, uh, phrased that she used earlier, design activism, and that's one that's directly aligned with my professional work, um, as well as I think the, the interests of not just the new generation of designers, um, but also foundations as funders, uh, municipalities and others as uh, clients, and um, it, it relates to these crises that uh, Professor uh, Castells talks about so well. Um, but I think more than anything, it relates with the kind of opportunities that there are for design to impact our society and to impact our world. Um, as uh, somebody finally mentioned, the state of our economy and how that is impacting recent graduates and, and soon to be uh, graduates. And I think that we're finding that the, the huge percentage of unemployment, uh, specifically within the architecture profession that I'm most familiar with, but I think in all the building industry areas, um, shows that we are so dependent on market forces. Our employment, our stability, everything we do is dependent on market forces. And yet the need for the services that we have to offer just continue to rise, and they in fact rise even more um, uh, more significantly during these down times in the economy. And so we've got to figure out a way to balance that. And I think that a college of this sort has uh, uh, has all the resources, all the expertise, all the knowledge to make a huge uh, stride in that direction. Um, and then finally. Somebody's mentioned, or a few people have mentioned uh, dual degrees and that kind of thing. I, I was thinking back about other classmates of mine that have gone on to do, I think, really contributive, really um, uh, uh, inspiring things, and they're, unlike me, they're all uh, dual degree recipients, and so they have dual degrees in, in landscape architecture and architecture, or architecture and city planning or other, other combinations of things. I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure that any one of the disciplines that we have here in the college is comprehensive enough for the complexity that we face uh, as designers. And then um, finally, this college, uh, it, although the term didn't come up today, I hear it all the time in, in all the other classes that, that I've been a part of here and um, across the country, we're, we think of ourselves as problem solvers. Um, one of the, the opportunities we have uh, that Professor Castells and others have talked about is to identify problems and propose solutions. And really, I think that that's, that's something that, employed or not, we have the, uh, the opportunity to do. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I think I'm the, the newbie of the group. Um, so I'm actually going to speak a lot from personal experiences, and hopefully that can start to frame the discussion about the future of the CED. Um, I think this morning's talk and, and some of the things that have already been said have helped to frame a lot of the societal issues, which are clearly not um, mutually exclusive of the, the issues that planners and designers will face. Um, and speaking personally, my, my own reasons for entering the planning profession were really informed by my personal engagements with planners who are versed in a lot of these macro issues, but less versed in its ro local ramifications. And just to give you an example, after six years of design school, and this includes architecture and urban design, I, I got my first professional job as a community design consultant. Um, I worked with a local community group in Pittsburgh to develop a design strategy for a grocery store and a broader neighborhood revitalization plan. Um, the community I was working for was Pittsburgh's Hill District. Um, this is a distressed neighborhood right next to the Central Business District. Um, and the community suffered from economic decline for years. Public health problems such as obesity and diabetes had been prevalent for many years. Um, the lack of fresh food access in particular, um, as well as the non-existence of a grocery store, contributed to the onset of these, these issues. Um, today, the issue of food access in particular is of greater concern to many planners, but back in 2005 and 2006, when I was working in the Hill District, I was very surprised by the disengagement of my local design and planning community from this particular topic. So how does this story relate to what we're talking about here, about the future of environmental design education? Um, my entry back into academia and into planning specifically was guided by my sense that one, 
planners should participate in developing policy and planning solutions to issues such as food access as part of broader neighborhood strategies, and that two, academia specifically can play a legitimizing role in redefining issues and resetting the agendas for our profession. An important facet of my work in the Hill, Hill District was that it grew out of work that I started in a studio at the master's level. Um, it was an outreach-oriented studio that I took when I did my urban design degree at Carnegie Mellon, and students such as myself would work jointly with local communities to develop neighborhood vision plans. And these plans would then serve as baseline studies for subsequent projects or academic research initiatives. And for, for me personally, this studio became more than just a simulated practical experience in urban design. It was through this studio that I was able to define this issue of food access as one that necessitated in part a design and planning intervention. And for me, it, this experience in the studio was a career defining and a career enabling experience that would lead me into the field of community development and now into planning. And for some of my other colleagues, it was a career enriching experience, one that added a certain value to degrees that were otherwise very technical. Um, I, I just want to quote uh, a part, part of the mission of the AICP, which is the certifying board of the APA, and they say that planning education should extend beyond the classroom and into the world of practice, working closely with practicing professionals in communities. And I, I encourage the panel here and all of you to consider how the studio might be part of efforts to do this. Um, in closing, I, I want to pose a couple questions um, to help frame a broader discussion about the future of environmental design education here at the CED. How can the CED use studio courses as a way not only to train students, but to redefine the issues des design and planning professions might address on global and local scales? And I think Suzanne really starts to get to this point. Hopefully, we can open this up to even more discussion. How can the studio serve as a forum for collaborative pursuits among departments within the university and with agencies and organizations outside of the university? And finally, how can studios be used as a tool to set research agendas for the CED? Um, I look forward to hopefully addressing some of these questions in our discussion. Thank you. My name is Bill Eisenstein, and I'd also like to thank the dean and others for inviting me to be here today, and I'm, I'm pleased to be on the panel. Um, I took a slightly different tack to this five minutes than my colleagues, and um, less in the nature of sort of specific recommendations, and I doubt I could improve on theirs anyway, um, but more um, in thinking about an instruction that the dean offered to us in inviting us here, which is to try to be provocative and to basically to think big about the next 50 years. Uh, and that sort of led me to two um, conclusions, which I, I think of as sort of realizations that I think perhaps the college and, more, and the professions more broadly um, need to come to in shaping our, our more concrete thinking about how we move forward uh, over the coming decades. Um, the first realization to me is that we're running out of time. Um, there's an ecologist named E.O. Wilson, who many of you may uh, be aware of, who has a concept called the bottleneck. And his argument is that in the 21st century, we are passing through a period in human history which has no precedent, and in which several really extraordinary forces are playing out at the same time. The world will industrialize and urbanize one time, and it's happening as we speak. The levels of carbon in the atmosphere will double or triple one time, and it's happening right now. The, uh, a third to a half of the species in the world will be threatened with extinction. That's happening right now. Uh, and the, uh, the developing world in particular um, is rising in population up to some sort of plateau level, potentially of nine to 10 billion globally. That is also playing out right now and will likely plateau and stabilize in the 21st century. All of these things are feeding into one another um, and form, I guess I'll, I will re per perhaps repeat the cliche that Professor Castells pointed out, but both a crisis and an opportunity um, for the design professions, for the planning professions, but and of course for the world generally. There, there may be 
a safe, secure, fair, prosperous world on the other side of the bottleneck? There, maybe. We all know that there are much grimmer alternatives that are possible as well. And the point I guess I'd like to make with all of this is that if we think of the 21st century, we have 100 years to come to grips with these forces. The people that are being educated right now in CED and elsewhere are the people who are going to, whose professional careers will take place over the first half of the bottleneck. The thought leaders of 2050, the senior faculty, the deans, the, the executive directors, the principals of firms, these are folks who are being educated in our institutions right now. So we have to prepare them for this world that, that is coming. I don't think that's news to anybody, um, but I do think that there is a sense of urgency that needs to be applied to this, which um, even in Berkeley, which is truly among the best places in the world for these ideas to, to be developed and thought about and debated and learned, even here I think that there is an insufficient sense of urgency about what we're facing in the, in the coming decades. The second idea um, is that I think if we're honest with ourselves, we will realize that as planners and as designers, we are actually largely powerless to shape the thing that we say we are shaping, which is cities, places, the landscapes we inhabit. Our professions are not the deciders in George Bush's terms. <laughs> um, again, as Professor Castell's uh, very cogently explained to us, um, our, our metropolitan regions, the places we inhabit every day, these are shaped by global macroeconomic forces over which we have no control, essentially. Um, the creation of our physical environments is largely driven by codes and standards and bureaucratic structures over which we as planners and designers have surprisingly little leverage, in my opinion. It mostly comes from engineering and from other professions. Um, so what do we do about that? I think to me that's another big challenge we have to think about in, in framing our thinking going forward. How do we put environmental design back into a central position of decision making about the world we actually do live in? Because it wasn't always this way. 120 years ago, Frederick Law Olmsted could design a wetland in Boston that was both a recreational site and also a sewage treatment site. In many ways, we are still struggling to get back to that point where we can do projects like that. And it's because 120 years ago, the, the, the codes and standards and the bureaucratization of placemaking had not fully taken hold yet. There was still much more freedom for someone like that to do a project like that. So how do we get back to a world where the real, the real decisions that underlie placemaking are, if not solely made by us, at least we have a seat at the table. So those are the two, um, the two ideas I'd like to toss forward as, as ways of thinking about this. First, uh, thank you, Jennifer, and all the organizers of this 50th anniversary celebration. This is fantastic, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, when asked to speak about uh, the future of the college, uh, my first instinct was to recognize that I, I think my colleagues and students are already future thinking. Uh, as, as my colleague, uh, Professor de Monchot, points out, we're thinking about the next, next thing. So when asked to think about the future, how do we think about, in fact, the future of the future, which is very difficult, uh, I think, proposition. And so the only thing I could think of is to come up with a kind of fantasy scenario uh, that's based on the seeds that I think are being planted by students and faculty right now at the university. And, and it's just sort of three little fairy tales, which I think might be interesting, uh, three or four. So I don't put you, we won't put you too far into the future, maybe 2015, 2016. So what's going on? Uh, the College of Environmental Design is getting ready to move into a new building. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the building is a critical response to issues of contemporaneity. Uh, it promotes transparency and collaboration. It's an armature for research, in fact. Uh, it's not hard, it's not cellular, it's not monastic. It is soft, transparent, and fluid. It's not gray, but it's green or whatever color of the architectural spectrum is important at that time. Uh, what else is going on? The, uh, Obama is in his second term and he's dealing with three ongoing wars. Um, so issues that are very important and on the minds of thesis students as they're discussing uh, these issues in, on social networks 
are issues of wartime architecture and post-war architecture, in fact. And these projects are being funded by the Department of Homeland Security and the recently formed Department of Peacetime Initiatives. Um, <laughs> Topics might be things like housing for veterans under 30, amputee accessibility, and demilitarization. So students are de increasingly uh, designing fewer buildings and more and more designing machines that design buildings or d machines that construct buildings. New hires are, uh, are software developers as much as they are architects. And students are using tools, uh, common tools on the desk of students are cheap robots that are salvaged from the, the radically reformed American automobile uh, 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 manufacturers. Um, so, and, and these studios and automation are probably jointly being tossed by engineers from Tata Motors in India, who's the largest uh, automobile manufacturer in the world, who's making cars that range from uh, $3,000 to, they recently purchased Land Rover uh, to $82,000. Pixar and Lucas Films have left the 2D, have left the 3D, and now they're working in augmented reality. And I think students will have to confront uh, designing simultaneously for the actual world and the virtual world at the same time. Uh, so, okay, so I'll end this fantasy right now because I, I, I think that what I'm suggesting here is that the future comes in two fronts. And the first is, uh, well, the, they are proof and provocation. The provocation is that there's a continued uh, blue sky creativity that I think designers are, are good at and that's extremely important, but that they respond to uh, important issues of the present. Uh, and the second is uh, the proof, and that is creating collaborations and obtaining funding uh, that engage the technologies and resources um, uh, to work at the cutting edge. and invite the panelists to ask each other questions. Anybody have burning questions of one another? Sure, so I think there was, there was a lot of discussion about studios and the potential of studios, and you actually spoke specifically of uh, how a studio really affected future work and your career, and I'm sort of curious to ask the other panelists, if they have other studios, they would say um, challenge, a particular studio memory that challenged them or that they think could have challenged them, sort of what, what the potential of a studio is and what our experiences have been. No one had an exciting studio other than yours. I'll pick up the ball on that. I had some very exciting studios. Um, and I, I guess I, th I feel that studio education is the fundamental pedagogical method that the college should be organized around. Um, so I, I would just uh, offer that general thought. Um, but I took, uh, for example, in 1998, I believe it was, or maybe spring of 99, um, I took a planning studio from Alan Jacobs. And we looked at the Fruitvale District of Oakland and it was the plan preparation studio, which is the, the one that is supposed to be the most interdisciplinary and the, and the least sort of, um, I'll, I'll use an, over, an overly negative word, but the least parochial of, of the studios um, in the sense that all um, disciplines within the planning department are, are invited in. Um, and the interaction of ideas and disciplinary perspectives in a studio context uh, is invaluable. Um, and in fact, it's, I think one of the short-term improvements the college could make to uh, offer my first specific recommendation and not just doomsaying <laughs> um, is, to, is to actually have a basic site planning studio that brings together all of the um, disciplines within the college. There currently isn't, to my knowledge, other than sort of um, efforts that maybe are powered by an individual professor to do a specific project there isn't, I don't believe, um, a sort of a core course that um, really would bring together architecture, <laughs> landscape, and planning all in the, same, in the same room. And I think site planning is the sort of the obvious candidate to do that. Um, 
And I, I, I guess I feel also that the value of Studio is to, is to drain some of the abstraction out of, um, out of big ideas. Big ideas are, are, are irreplaceable. Um, we have to have them, but we also need to bring them, apply them in real places. Um, and so studios like the Fruitvale one were ideal for that. I, wanna, I just want to jump in here um, and say that, uh, that the idea of a super studio is something that we've been crafting this year and hopefully we'll have on deck next year. So I think I'm con certainly convinced of that too. A lot of other people are and we'll see what we can cook up across the college. Um, but I want to challenge you guys. I heard um, a lot about doom and gloom, the, the, the kinds of barriers that we're going to be facing, uh, perhaps magnified uh, in magnified form. But um, I want to pick up and, and see if we can't get a little bit bolder. You suggested essentially teleses too, right? Um, and I want to hear more about what that might look like and how that might, I mean, you can't, it, it's organic essentially, right? You can't say, oh, we're going to go do this. It has to actually happen. But what are the conditions under which we might foment that kind of activity? Um, the other thing I want to ask you about is really what Ron was talking about. Um, a lot of work is about um, placemaking. Um, it's about uh, making cities healthier, more equitable. But the kind of challenges that you suggested if we're looking at climate change and climate wars and climate refugees and all of the other things that may unfold as a result of this bottleneck, um, you know, maybe we need to be really way out there and thinking about some of these things in a much bolder way. And I'm just wondering if part of the role of the college is to be as outrageous as possible. Dissolve all fields and concentrations. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> I, I had an opportunity as, so as an urban plan, trained as an urban planner, I had an opportunity to then get a fellowship through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where I worked in a school of public, while well, I was in a school of public health for two years, completely foreign field for me. And the, the, the program was designed to have people work together. So there was an economist next to me, there was a, a neuroscientist and so forth. And I can tell you the that was one of the most exciting times in my life in terms of creativity, in terms of the ideas that people had. And one of the things that we talked about is like, gee, this is great. Why can't we do this all the time? Well, after those two years are up, people need to get a job. There are these little categories that are say, you know, are you an urban planner or are you a policy or are you public health? And there's very little area for the types of things that students want. And I think that if we were really gonna be innovative, let's break down our fields and concentrations. And instead of me being a specialist in housing, community, and economic development, I'm Professor Malo Hudson that is concerned about ecological degradation. I'm concerned about equality. I'm con concerned about all these things. And if there's a student in public health, if there's a student in uh, sociology, if there's a student in engineering that wants to take my course, then they can. They don't need course requirement codes and that sort of thing. Um, you see it, certainly being trained at MIT for my doctorate, you see it all the time with the Media Lab. Great things come out of the Media Lab and not so great things come out of the Media Lab. But the point is, it's taking people with all different types of skills and backgrounds from all over the world, not just the US or one particular region, all over the world, and they're able to create things. And they're able to challenge themselves and think out. And I think what happens now is I get students all the time that say, well, you know, I would like to take this class, but there are these requirements, that are, or you know, I'm not that major. And I think that's a, that's a huge hindrance. But if you look at other disciplines and what they're doing, they're breaking down those barriers. Scientists have figured, you know, engineers and biologists, as I mentioned earlier, they do this now. They do this now. Um, so I don't see why we can't do it in this field. I would concur, and I think to a certain degree it's been mentioned already that interdisciplinary and the thought that people who did double majors actually are the people out there that are movers and shakers. Um, I sort of challenge the system, the graduate assistant in the landscape architecture at the time knew me well because every semester I came in with all my petition slips to take all my classes out of order and or to take classes in the architecture department and other departments. Um, I sort of tried to get the most out of Berkeley and I, I was very happy with what I did but I think a lot of people don't necessarily 
they kind of get stuck in this, here's your three-year course schedule. These are the 20 courses you have to take in this particular order. And then you maybe have flexibility to add one or two classes at the end. Um, and it, it sort of goes on to then when they graduate, they go into an office and they get stuck behind the computer doing red lines for two years. And it really kills, I think, the, the visionary uh, and the passion that most of us come to school with. Um, and I think those of us that have pushed the boundaries or done other disciplines or challenge or work interdisciplinary realize that we can't do it all ourselves. My knowledge can really only make a difference if it is combined with uh, an architect's knowledge, combined with uh, a social justice person's knowledge, combined with a planner's knowledge, and together all of our knowledge then really makes significant changes. Um, and this, I think, is, is something that interdisciplinary studios um, can help bring about. Um, and to a certain degree, I think there's sort of two studio models that can work. There is the interdisciplinary, which I think is really important. There is the studio that is taught in association with research. I did an architecture studio where we did uh, a whole building science research class associated with it that was really amazing. Um, and then there are studios where you actually go out and build things and work with communities that are struggling or have vacant land. Um, I think all of these open our eyes to the potential of how much more powerful we can be um, multidisciplinary. And I think that to a certain degree, uh, a lot of that has been challenged by the parsing of the disciplines and a lot of the egos in the disciplines. And we need to break that down. So I'll just respond briefly to the Telesis 2 question and say that I see some seeds going on already of uh, our generation of students and young recent graduates taking really innovative means to use their skills. Um, last semester, the landscape department formed the Landscape Progress Administration and went out for a week and did volunteer work and really went out into the community and thought about how they can make a positive reaction to the economic constraints that they're seeing on campus and in our communities. And uh, some recent graduates of the landscape department formed Rebar, which formed Parking Day, and really has um, actions and designs and images that can challenge our preconceptions about the need for parking spaces in our cities or what else can happen in our streets and by really innovative countercultural responses. So I think that those seeds are there and I think we should keep pushing them, especially in our student years and in our possibly underemployed moments to come. <laughs> um, I just wanna follow on what's been said already and I, I think um, just from my personal experience, the studio format really lends itself to the type of interdisciplinary collaboration that we're talking about. And I wonder whether more can be done at the graduate level um, in terms of the interdisciplinary collaborations across the university. Because at the undergraduate level, there may be more of an emphasis on making sure that students develop a certain set of skills in order to get their architect's license, get their AICP. Um, but there, there's, of course, still room for interdisciplinary work probably in the, the senior years, but I think maybe we should take a look at the, the graduate program a little bit closer and see what the possibilities are with that. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Can I hand one of these mics to somebody in the audience to ask a good question? Another good question, I should say, with all respect. Um, one of the things that one faces for the environmental design is one's building cities. If one has a laptop and it's a lemon, one can afford to buy another one. One can't just buy, you know, buy another city if, the, if the, what you're doing is a lemon. So there tends to be a great conservatism and a bureaucracy blockade there. But actually, there's a flow from mathematics education, pure science, fundamental physics, applied science, technology, applied 
technology all the way out to design, there's really bureaucratic blocks all the way along. There's, there's fortresses. So one has to look at the question of strategy. And essentially, one just bypasses fortresses. If you look at Guderian with tanks and Blitzkrieg or Genghis Khan or Sun Tzu, um, in every case, you win when you essentially have the best maneuvering. Now, the intellectual tool for maneuvering essentially is the internet, modern telecommunications. And so <clears throat> besides going beyond just the, trying to go beyond the silos of a particular university, one needs maneuverability to be able to go out and put out social networks of everybody in the world who wants to advance a particular idea, a particular moment, as fast as possible, maneuver around the more static social networks. And a question? Well, I would comment. Ellen can comment. Okay. Um, anybody, anybody want to respond to that question about social networks and connectivity technology? Is this working? I don't know. How about that one? Yep. Um, I guess I would just say that I do think there's some interesting possibilities with the idea of open source design. And I, I think maybe MIT, uh, I'm, I'm looking at folks who have MIT connections, but I think there's been some of that thinking done there. But putting a design problem out there on the internet with, some and with a program, essentially, uh, and then anybody can kind of come in and, and submit ideas in an organic fashion, like a Wikipedia page, essentially. I think there is, there is interesting possibility for that kind of thing. Um, uh, my name is Martin Vanenthorn. I'm a uh, visiting scholar here at uh, the college uh, since two weeks. Um, the discussion about uh, interdisciplinarity is um, something which I think is a little uh, disturbing because um, the comparison with science is not completely right. Scientists are always uh, always uh, specialists. So interdisciplinarity is for them uh, a need. Designers are generalists. So interdisciplinarity in design is something different than uh, interdisciplinarity in science. That's, I, I think, an important point to take into account. I do think that um, it's one of the strong points of, uh, of this uh, college Interdisciplinarity is not really a problem see here as I see it. You know, I'm coming from Delft. Um, the second thing is um, the by far the most important remark I've heard about the qualities what a college should offer is for, foremost learning to think. And um, of course, we have heard this uh, talks about computer programs that change in three years, so it's no use to teach computer programs, but I would li I'd like to ask the panel um, and the audience, what would be the necessary content to learn to think for the future? Okay. Interdisciplinary, I think. I'm not sure that this makes any difference. Um, the, inter, the interdisciplinary um, challenge, I think there's a couple different challenges there. For me, I think that to a certain degree, designers should be a certain level of a specialist, but to have interdisciplinary studios, you get, you understand the other disciplines and how they can contribute, uh, that another specialist and your specialist in working together can become something much greater. And so I wouldn't encourage that all of us become totally interdisciplinary ourselves, but that we work in an interdisciplinary manner and not in the ego manner. In terms of challenging to think, um, I would say Berkeley so far has done uh, a good job of that. But I think it, it, I don't know the current conditions, not being a student. Um, but I think 
that it needs to start challenging the students to think about m massive water shortages, massive temperature changes, um, like some of the things you said, um, you know, 30-year-old uh, war veterans, um, potentially rampant disease, um, major catastrophes. Um, these are the things that we need to be challenged with, not can we fit, uh, you know, five park benches uh, within this space. One last question. In a super studio that tried to teach how to build a healthy and sustainable city and buildings, everybody say that interdisciplinary is important, but which professional, in your opinion, should be the top? So it's most <laughs> important to have a, a doctor, an allergologist, an economist, a sociologist, a philosopher, a mechanical engineer, an architect, an urban planner. If you have to now propose for this school a studio, a super studio, which people would you put at least? You cannot put 100. Let's say five people. Well, see, I think you're, you start off with the wrong question. I think you need to talk, talk about what the problem is. Right, so that's, that's the issue, the problem that I see with our education is that we're training people in their disciplines and in their silos to do what? To solve what? I have students that come to me all the time, know all these theories, and I just say, how does this theory apply to real world? Show me one thing that you're working on in your, dis in your dissertation or in your thesis that this theory applies to. Well, I, I don't know, but they can claim the theories. But the question that we should be asking is, what are the problems? And depending on the problem, that will depend on who needs to be at the table, right? So, it, and I don't think that's the, with academia, we're so much about hierarchy, who's, a, who's on top and this. I think it should be about who can work together <laughs> to solve problems, right? So it's, it's not about who's this and who's that. It's about, can you bring your design skills with my community economic development focus with your experience, your experience, and can we then, and then your broad thinking and challenging us to think broadly, how can we work together? That's why I couldn't disagree more with the gentleman who said that interdisciplinarity is not important, or maybe I'm you know, paraphrasing. That's absolutely, in my opinion, the wrong way of thinking, and that's why we're in the situation we are in today. I think if you really want to make a difference, if you really want to challenge ourselves, break down all these barriers and say, who needs, to be at the pro who needs to be at the table and there's a problem? And what problems are we trying to solve? This major initiative, which is brings together the best universities in Europe with the best companies in Europe, creating networks throughout Europe, is based on that principle. You start with a problem and bring in entire universities, entire companies, hundreds of millions of euros to solve the problem and create a PhD program like climate change, sustainable energy, information technology for the benefit of society. So these ideas are being implemented. So it's a time that Great. Um, we are, we're already pretty behind. Um, I want to just thank the panelists for some very provocative ideas, some of which, you know, I can implement and, and get underway right away, which all is, is great. Um, I don't have to wait for 50 years. Um, some of the things like dissolving all the departments might have to <clears throat> take a while. Might have to think about that. Uh, Porous, porous, yes. Um, but uh, in general, I think that these kinds of contributions, um, these kinds of ideas, uh, these kinds of provocations are something that we should do on a much more regular basis, that we should institutionalize in, in and hopefully that doesn't destroy it, but um, we need to create a space 
both for the kinds of interdisciplinary studios and collaborations that are problem-oriented that Mala talked about, but also the kinds of um, informal settings uh, that are available on a regular basis for people to think about, okay, how do we cook up Telesis too? How do we think about what to do when we can't find a job? Um, what to do when uh, large-scale events propel us and make it uh, uh, inevitable that we move forward and try to think about doing things differently. So uh, I'm very grateful to everybody for to participating and want to um, give you all thanks. thanks.